So uh, my name is Luke Hoban. I work at Microsoft. Uh, I work on a few different JavaScript-related uh, pieces of technology. Um, I work for Microsoft on TC39, the standards body, which uh, works on standardizing uh, ECMAScript uh, and JavaScript. Um, I work on the Chakra JavaScript engine that is part of uh, Internet Explorer and Windows 8. Uh, and I also talk, uh, work on a project called TypeScript, which is what we'll be talking about today, um, which aims to bring uh, some features for application scale development uh, to JavaScript. So one of the general trends uh, I think that we've seen has been that the web platform has been sort of growing in, in capabilities incredibly quickly over the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, we've seen performance going up at a dramatic pace in terms of what the, um, the JavaScript VMs can do, what the core browser rendering engines can do. Uh, we've seen the capabilities of the core platform itself improve uh, dramatically through the sort of AJAX and HTML5 eras. Um, and generally, we've seen the sort of libraries and, and the tools available to developers sort of increasingly grow and, and enable richer and richer kinds of uh, experiences to be built uh, on top of the web and using JavaScript. Uh, but one of the places we haven't seen as much uh, sort of movement has been in the actual language and core, uh, core developer tooling experience. Um, that is available for web developers. Um, the JavaScript language obviously um, is beginning to move now, and we're, we're working actively in TC39 um, on evolving the ECMAScript language. Um, but it does take some time for that process to go through. Um, and TypeScript is one of our goals about how we can try to bring some of the um, sort of application scale development experiences to developers uh, to use today uh, for development. So what we kind of specifically mean by that um, TypeScript is a uh, typed superset of JavaScript uh, that compiles back down to plain JavaScript. I'll go into a little bit of detail about what that means uh, in a second. One of the really key things is, um, this is this works on any browser. Uh, this works in any JavaScript host environment. It works on Node. It works in a browser. It works inside um, any application which is hosting a JavaScript VM. Uh, and it works on any operating system. The whole tool chain we've got uh, is available to be run uh, anywhere. Um, not just on Microsoft's platforms. Uh, and uh, it's open source. This is a project that we've been developing uh, in the open actively uh, since we first put it out publicly uh, last October. Uh, and so this is a project that is, is very much from the get-go open source uh, um, investment from Microsoft. So um, to give a quick overview of what TypeScript is before I dump, jump into some uh, demos here, TypeScript starts with JavaScript. Uh, so all the JavaScript that you have, all the libraries, uh, JavaScript libraries you use, um, all of that is uh, already TypeScript. Uh, TypeScript builds on top of everything that is legal JavaScript today. That means you can, if you go hit the web and find a page where you have an example about um, how to use some particular new API or some new library, you can grab that code, copy, paste into TypeScript and continue using it. It's a huge benefit. It means that the enormous massive investment in JavaScript um, is maintained and still available to you uh, while you're using TypeScript. It also means all the libraries that you would want, want to use are going to work with TypeScript. So there's not sort of an interoperation layer there. Um, everything is just JavaScript. What TypeScript adds is optional static typing, classes, uh, and modules. And optional static typing is really the sort of key uh, bedrock for providing a whole different set of tooling experiences um, that are very challenging to provide over JavaScript by itself but if you have just a sprinkling of some of these type inf pieces of type information in your code, it allows you to get much richer um, static analysis, error checking as you're typing code. You're going to find out about some errors in your code. You get better documentation of your system. Uh, and you get some of the sort of rich IDE capabilities if you're interested in using uh, IDEs like um, WebStorm or Visual Studio or things like that. The, uh, the types are zero cost, so uh, you can use these type annotations in your code, but they all disappear at runtime, and so you're not paying any overhead, you're not running on some different semantics, some, your code doesn't mean something different. What your code means is just exactly what you expect it to mean as a JavaScript developer. Um, but these types allow you to sort of annotate your intention and capture that in your code. When we compile this, we compile it back down into JavaScript. Uh, the JavaScript is, uh, we like to think of it as idiomatic JavaScript. This is uh, JavaScript that is really one-to-one -one with the code that you wrote. Um, almost everything is exactly just the code you wrote. At the expression and statement levels, it's just your code. Um, when we take things like classes, we turn those into what, what the kind of pattern of code that you would probably have written had you were to actually write that yourself. So one of our goals is that you could take that JavaScript um, and that could be code that you would be proud of by itself. The quality of that code it should be high enough. It shouldn't look like it's generated by a machine. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, uh, the JavaScript that we emit uh, runs anywhere. 
I think uh, there's nothing we actually ourselves emit that doesn't work on uh, IE6. Um, of course, if you write JavaScript code which depends on specific features of specific environments, um, then we're going to let you do that. Okay, so uh, for, for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I want to just go and do a kind of demo through a bunch of the experiences that are available uh, with TypeScript. Uh, and so let me start here. Um, actually, I'll come back. So the, the TypeScript uh, site, um, at typescriptlang.org, uh, has a bunch of information about TypeScript, uh, but one of the really nice things it has uh, is something we call the TypeScript Playground. The TypeScript Playground uh, lets you uh, take a look at what TypeScript looks like. Um, so we can take, on the left, we can see the TypeScript code, uh, and on the right, we can see the JavaScript code that is compiled as the output of that. Now, a couple of things to note about this first example here. Um, so everything on the left is actually just JavaScript. I literally, you know, this is code I copy-pasted in, it's legal JavaScript code. Um, there's nothing that's TypeScript specific here. Uh, and when I compile it, you see that my output is effectively the exact same thing. Uh, in fact, I think it is actually exactly the same thing uh, as what's on the input. Um, so, so here, like when I pass through this code, um, obviously nothing changes. TypeScript's just sort of passing through uh, the code as is. But now let me run this. Uh, so when I run it, I click the button. And you'll see this hello object object here um, telling me uh, something seems like it's not quite working as I might expect uh, in this code. So if I come over here, I can start using uh, some of the features that TypeScript has that sort of build upon JavaScript. Uh, so the first thing I can do is I can come here and say colon string. And that does a few things. Uh, what that indicates is that me as the author of this function here, I expect that someone's going to pass me a string. If they don't pass me a string, I want them to be told that they're probably doing something wrong. They're probably passing me data that's not what I expected. You can kind of think of this like the documentation. Uh, the documentation for an API you use often will say, you know, this, this parameter is expected to be a string, this parameter is expected to be a number, this is expected to be a function. This is really just a way of putting that documentation in the code so that it's part of the program and so that tools can leverage it and give you feedback on it um, directly. The next thing to notice is that although it exists on the left-hand side, um, it disappears on the right-hand side. Uh, so I added this type annotation. It doesn't change what my code means in any way. My, my JavaScript code is exactly the same. This is just something that helps out the tools, helps out my development experience. Uh, the next thing you probably noticed when I typed that, that this little red squiggle appeared down here. Um, so immediately, because I had that information, uh, we knew from looking at this code that, hey, this is probably not correct. I'm calling this greeter function and passing it this object literal here. And that's not a string. Now, technically, that object literal, like in JavaScript, that's going to get implicitly converted to a string. It's going to you know, be OK. Um, you know, something might work, uh, like what we saw happen in, when I clicked run there. But it's probably not what I wanted. I probably was doing something wrong in this case. Um, and so the error is, is telling me that. One of the key things, though, is even though I'm getting this error, I'm still getting JavaScript on the output side. So these errors don't prevent me from co compiling my code. They're just telling me, you probably made a mistake here. There's probably something in your code uh, which could, uh, could be better. The last thing uh, to notice about this type annotation is that if I come in here and say greeting dot, I get IntelliSense. Um, so I get a completion list here that gives me information about what I can do uh, with this greeting. Uh, now, of course, in this case, there were no callers of this that passed it a string. So there's no way for it to know what, what kind of IntelliSense should be here. As soon as I say colon string, uh, it knows now I can give the, the completion list based on the information that that parameter was expected to be a string. Um, and so with these type annotations, we can get a lot of these benefits uh, related to typing. Okay, now one actual uh, thing here that's interesting is as well as me adding type annotations myself, uh, so in this case I added this colon string, even before I did that, in fact, let me um, come and delete that. Even before I did that, I was actually getting some benefits from these types because the libraries I was using were typed. Um, and so in this example, we actually uh, ship a built-in typing for uh, for the DOM, for the environment in which your JavaScript code is executing inside a browser. Um, and so that means that the document variable is a global variable that we know is available in the browser, and we know its type is document. And in fact, the web standards bodies publish strongly typed descriptions of all these APIs, so we can sort of automatically generate the exact correct typing for those, uh, for those APIs based on what's already published by the standards and maintained as part of uh, the standards and as part of the browser implementations. And this gives us a whole ton of information, right? Because we know that document is of type document, which means we know create element is a function that takes a, a tag and returns an HTML element, which means we know that this is an HTML button element, which means we know this is a string, 
which means you know on click is a function which is going to take a mouse event and return any. So, but just from that one piece of information and all that library typing, even without us writing any annotations in our code, we get a ton of information. What that means is if I make a mistake here, and let's say I mistype inner text, I get the information about that immediately. As soon as I make that typo in my code, the feedback is right there. I can fix it. I don't have to go through a debug cycle. I don't have to go through a unit test cycle. I'm getting that feedback immediately um, during my typing. And that's sort of something you can get for free as soon as you have some of this type information flowing uh, through your system. OK, um, so that was, that was a quick look at types. Now, one of the interesting things, uh, when I showed that, I turned this into a string. Well, actually, let me just show. If I turn this into a string and I fix this, uh, this is a way of fixing our bug, right? So now we run our code, we press our button, and now it says hello world. Um, so we found, we found that error there. But you may wonder, well, what if I actually wanted to pass an object literal here? I want to pass an options bag with some, some properties that sort of configure my object. How do I do that? So what you can do here is I can come in and say, I actually want this not to be a string, but to be some object which has a message property, which is a string. And then I'm going to use that message property as part of this. So this might be another way of correctly writing this code. It may have been that my implementation itself uh, was wrong. And so I can do this sort of thing, and this allows me to sort of capture any shape. So anytime I'm taking parameters of some certain shape in my code, I can describe that shape as well. Uh, and this is really handy. It's very much like, obviously, in JavaScript, we, we pass around lots of structured data. Um, and so our APIs want to have these sort of structured um, uh, types uh, on their signatures. But of course, you can imagine that it would get kind of wordy if I had to do this every place I wanted to pass some structured piece of information. I can't just describe in every single um, signature all these types. Um, and so TypeScript has a notion of interfaces. So I can say, let me declare an interface called greeter options. And let me just give it a message colon string. So now I can take this and just replace it with greeter options. And this actually does exactly the same thing as the code did before. Um, the interface is just a way of giving a name, greeter options, uh, to a type. In this case, uh, an object that has a message property whose type is string. And these types are structural. Um, and that's a really key thing. In JavaScript, we can sort of pass around data. And all that we care is whether I can access certain members and whether they have the kind of the behaviors that I expect. Will, if I access this member and then I call it, is that going to work? Um, and so in TypeScript, we have a structural type system, which means that um, any shape, like this object literal down here, which matches my interface's shape, is going to be OK. Um, if I pass the wrong kind of data, though, like if the shape of my object didn't match, I had a typo again, then I get that error. Um, and so we're able to sort of do this sort of structural matching of all the data you're passing around uh, in your code. Now, JavaScript objects can have properties like this message here. Um, but JavaScript objects can also have things like, uh, like functions. right? So we, we often have a JavaScript object that has a, a function on it, like foo here. Um, and so we can write that out in the signature. So now, as well as me seeing message there, uh, we also see this foo method. Uh, if I call that, um, I hit dot, I get the, the completion list I expect for numbers. Now, oftentimes, our, um, our functions in JavaScript APIs can be called with multiple different kinds of data. So you think about jQuery, for instance. The jQuery function can be called with a string, or it can be called with a callback function can be called with an element. Um, there's lots of different ways to call it. And so if I want to describe that, I might want to say here, maybe I, foo also has a version that can take a string, and that one returns a number as well. So I can call foo either with no parameters or with a single parameter that is a string. And I want to describe that both of those patterns for calling this API are legal. Um, so I can do that like this. And again, if I come down here and type greeting dot, uh, you see I have foo. And now I have the two options here in my completion list. So either of those will be legal. Now, the interesting thing is if you, uh, if you know sort of the, the way that JavaScript objects work, there is no actual difference between properties and methods in JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript objects just have a set of properties on them. Uh, and those properties might happen to be some callable object. And so this code here that describes this overload is actually the same as me saying the following. So this is me saying that um, I actually just have a single property named foo. Uh, but that single property is an object which can be called, uh, but can be called with two different patterns. Um, so this is the sort of way of capturing this really low-level notion of what JavaScript objects are like and what the shape of JavaScript objects is. And one of the things you're probably picking up here is we, we really care a lot about using TypeScript's type system to model the way that JavaScript APIs actually exist today. 
So we really want to be able to go out to any JavaScript API that you might write or you might use and describe the API that it exposes in similar to the way that the, the documentation does, but in a formal way that we can then uh, build this kind of tooling over top of. Um, of course, that notion of being callable, we can sort of do ourselves. So our greeter options itself uh, might be a callable object. So it would have members on it. So it would have um, the message property. Uh, but it would also be callable itself. And if I call it, I get back dates. And one, one last thing that we can do here um, is uh, create indexers. So I can say something like, um, if indexed on a number, uh, I'm going to return you back an HTML element. So now I come in here and I say greeting dots, and I've still got my message property, but if I index at 34, I have the things I would expect for an HTML element. So I can sort of capture all these different notions that you might expect in this API. And you might think that this kind of thing is, you know, this, this one I've written here is a little crazy, right? It's got, you know, callableness and indexing and all these things. Um, but if you've looked at some of the core DOM APIs, many of them are actually about as strange as what I've described here, right? Like the window property has different behavior whether you index on numbers or strings. It's callable, it's sometimes newable. Um, so we really are trying to be able to model sort of anything, including all the interesting behaviors that some of the DOM APIs have. Okay, so that's a quick tour of the uh, TypeScript types. Uh, let me just come in here and go to look at classes. So um, class is the other sort of most notable uh, uh, feature of TypeScript. Um, and classes in TypeScript are based on uh, the work that's being done on something called maximally minimal classes in ECMAScript 6. Uh, so ECMAScript 6 is planning on having a uh, syntax for classes. Um, that syntax encodes a very thin sugar over the basic prototypal class pattern that people are using all the time in, in JavaScript today. Uh, and in fact, if I look at the code, so here you see I wrote the class, and it's sort of one nice declaration uh, wrapped, you know, sort of wrapped in curlies, one sort of nested dec uh, lexical declaration there. Um, one key thing to note is the code that gets generated on the right. If you look at this, this piece of the code here is actually exactly what I had written originally. This is exactly just, you know, a constructor function and then put a method on the prototype, right? This is, this is the kind of pattern that, that you've, you will have written a lot if you've done any sort of um, object-oriented code uh, in JavaScript. Uh, and so that's what we compile uh, the class into, is that simple pattern. We just wrap it in a closure to make sure that its state will all get initialized at once. Uh, the couple of things to notice, um, the one thing that goes beyond, obviously, what, uh, what ECMAScript 6 is doing is type annotations. Um, so here you'll see that there's type annotation on the parameter. And we've also indicated that there's a greeting property, and we've indicated the type of that greeting property. So just like we have type annotations on variables, we also have type annotations on, on um, classes, which describe what, what pieces of state exist on this, um, on this class. Now, classes offer several kind of additional benefits on top of, um, on top of just uh, being a shorthand sugar for writing out all this code on the right. Uh, probably the most important one is that classes, as well as defining a constructor object, like I saw on the right there, classes also give me a new type. Um, so instead of me having to write out one of those interfaces to describe the shape of this thing, I get one of those for free. And so whenever I create a new instance of greeter here, you'll see that if I hover over um, this variable, we know that that, that that variable now has the type greeter uh, because that class definition gave us one of these types for free. And again, that gives us a bunch more information. So for instance, we now know that this greet function down here um, is actually defined up here. So we can associate these two pieces of code. Uh, we know that um, the, the greet method on a greeter um, is this piece of code here. And that means we can do interesting things like, uh, like renaming. So I can do something like say hello. Uh, and there in line, I've renamed that. I found all the locations where that was used and defined. Um, I've renamed them in place. Obviously, in the playground, I'm also renaming the, the JavaScript code. Um, and so I can do these sort of much richer IDE kind of capabilities on top of this. Uh, but again, more important than any of that stuff is really the simplest of the ID features, which is just telling me immediately as soon as I have that typo. I missed ty I've left, left out an L there. I got that feedback immediately inside um, my editing environment. Okay. The last of the sort of main features of TypeScript is modules. Um, so modules are obviously um, an increasingly important part of uh, development. Uh, in JavaScript, pretty much everyone is using some sort of module patterns. Um, either they're using sort of um, basic module patterns to do sort of namespace-based hierarchies, or they're using some of the more advanced kind of loader-based systems like AMD, um, or if they're doing Node, um, using CommonJS. Uh, so TypeScript has sort of first-class language support for, um, for sort of all of these kinds of patterns for, for modules. 
so here you see an example where we have, we've taken that greeter class and we've put it inside a module SAMES. Um, you see that generates some code out here that just wraps it in a closure, um, so kind of pretty standard for what you would expect to see um, in, uh, in your JavaScript code. Um, but the nice thing is now that lets us, when we can say new sayings.greeter, um, we now also take the type that was defined associated with that um, class, and it's also namespaced. So now we have the, the type here is sayings.greeter. So because we have syntax for this, we're able to make sure that it's uh, mirrored both in, the, both in the JavaScript code and in the types that are associated with that, uh, which is a nice benefit. The, um, the slightly more interesting thing, actually, is what happens if I um, come and delete some of this code. Uh, do that. And so here I just have a single class, but I have it exported. Um, so up at the top here, I just said export class. And this, when I have a top-level export in one of my files, uh, what that means is that I'm, uh, I want to be a loadable module. I want to be a piece of code that can be loaded um, by other components of the system. Um, this is exactly like what ECMAScript 6 is doing as well. Um, so ECMAScript 6 is supporting this notion of um, having a built-in module loader and having syntax for participating in that module loader. I'm kind of enabling some of the things that AMD provides, but in the browser directly. Uh, and TypeScript gives you that ability to write this code, and it compiles it to a form that can work in browsers today. So in this case, um, by default, uh, if you have a top-level export, you'll see that we write that out of the exports object. So this is code that will work with any CommonJS compatible loader. This will work in Node.js, for instance. Um, but you can pass a flag to the compiler um, to tell it to emit this code in an AMD compatible module. Um, so I can just write my AMD modules using, uh, using TypeScript, using top-level exports. Um, so that's a little handy feature. I'll show another deeper example of that um, a little bit later. Okay, so that's, that's a tour through uh, the major features uh, of, um, of TypeScript uh, 0.8. So we, uh, we first put out uh, TypeScript uh, last October. Um, and since then, we've seen a really great sort of community develop around uh, TypeScript. Uh, probably the most exciting piece of this has actually been uh, a project called Definitely Typed uh, that, that popped up just a couple days after we started the project, um, which took a bunch of the most popular libraries out there, um, JavaScript libraries, and created uh, descriptions of their APIs using TypeScript. Um, and what this means is that you can go in with any JavaScript library you're using, you can go up to Definitely Typed, grab the library typing for that, and get all these benefits, get this immediate feedback if you have an error in your, if you have a, a typo in your code, the completion lists, the, uh, every, the refactorings, all this kind of support. You can get all that for the libraries that you're using today, um, uh, immediately inside your editing environment. Uh, and if I come over here, I can take a look. Um, this is definitely typed now. It's, it's growing uh, very fast. Um, there's something like 180 libraries up on here, um, pages and pages of these libraries. There's about 100 developers who have contributed into this project um, who have worked on some of these libraries or are users of these libraries. Um, and this is sort of an actively maintained uh, project to sort of be a central repository for all the different libraries out there. Um, and so this has been really great in terms of making it so that you can get all these benefits really broadly across all the JavaScript uh, libraries you're using. Uh, we have also been excited to see the sort of tools and build integration. So we, um, we as Microsoft, built uh, integration into Visual Studio. Um, I'll, I'll demo some of that in a little bit. Um, obviously, into the, uh, the playground environment that I showed there. Um, WebStorm have also added support uh, for TypeScript recently, uh, which is great. Um, Cloud9 has support uh, for TypeScript. Um, in brackets, there's an extension that supports it. Um, and for those of you using um, text editors instead of sort of IDEs, um, we, uh, we seeded the community with some basic support in Sublime Text and VI and Emacs. Uh, we've seen folks out in the developer communities um, more associated with those tools actually pick those up uh, and add a bunch more capabilities to them. So there's great support for TypeScript uh, in a lot of the basic um, uh, text editors there. Uh, we've also seen build integration. So, uh, folks who are using TypeScript are often using it in, in fairly large projects. Um, that's sort of where a lot of the, these benefits are, are most, um, uh, most uh, extreme. Uh, and in those environments, they're sort of wanting to, to plug them into sort of some of the interesting build chains that we've seen. So um, folks using it with Node.js, ASP.NET, Ruby, Grunt, etc. cetera, um, there's support for plugging TypeScript into these environments. Uh, we've also been doing uh, all the work on this uh, open source uh, on Coplex. Um, so you can come up to typescript.coplex.com uh, to check out the project. Um, see, there's a bunch of uh, work going on um, here. We've had uh, more than 1,000 issues reported on, on the issue tracker. We're working with a lot of folks in the, in the user community to, um, uh, to sort of figure out where the areas to uh, improve the language are. 
Um, but all the code's up here, lots of forks, lots of people working uh, on this as well. Um, I guess the last thing to note on that is that uh, we've also been excited about some of the projects that have been using uh, TypeScript. So um, one example of that, uh, a library called Turbulence uh, uh, just recently put out an update that uses TypeScript. It's a game framework uh, for building HTML games. Um, they're using TypeScript uh, to, to, as part of the sort of way that the framework leverages, um, uh, leverages JavaScript. Um, I showed you that uh, IDE uh, experience that we had um, inside the browser. So that's being used in a few other places in, in some things like Windows Azure uh, as management portal here um, for using triggers in Azure mobile services as using this. Um, and several other large teams inside Microsoft and outside of Microsoft have been, uh, have been picking up TypeScript and using it, uh, even in the, the early preview stage uh, that we're still at. Okay, so the, the next uh, phase for TypeScript um, is uh, the upcoming TypeScript 0.9. Um, so we've been, since we released, we've been getting a ton of feedback uh, on the language places where uh, we can make it better, where we could fill in existing holes, where we could go and, and do new things. Um, we've been sort of releasing uh, minor updates to that every, every six to eight weeks or so um, since then. Uh, but we've, we've been working most heavily on uh, a big update for TypeScript 0.9 which really addresses some of the biggest pieces of feedback we've gotten since we first released. Um, so there's two interesting uh, areas where we're focusing. One is tool scalability. Um, so obviously we're really targeting large-scale development with TypeScript. Uh, and when we talk about large-scale development, we're talking sort of 10,000, 100,000, several hundred thousand line code bases. Uh, we have a lot of these kind of things inside Microsoft, which is where one of the original motivations for this project. Um, but we're increasingly talking to teams outside of Microsoft who have things in this scale building rich uh, web applications. So we wanted to build tools that could support this kind of scale of development. Um, and we know the language is, is, was worked out very well at that scale. One of the interesting things is just building developer tools that can handle that much source code is actually a challenge by itself. Um, and we thought we'd have some time to sort of really uh, sort of take on that challenge because it takes a while to write 100,000 lines of code um, in a language which uh, we had just released. One of the things I think we've found out is that um, the, because it's so easy to take JavaScript code and bring it into TypeScript, uh, a lot of teams were able to get up to the 100,000 line scale pretty much overnight. They had the existing code base. They ran some tool that sort of uh, changed a couple of things. And suddenly, hey, I've got 100,000 lines of TypeScript. I'm using that inside your editing environment. Um, so that's a great thing. It meant we got a lot of, lot of experience with what that looks like at scale. But it identified that there were some places where we needed to make those tools really much smoother to work with at that scale. Um, so I've done a bunch of work on that. A bunch of that work is also sort of core work in the TypeScript compiler. Um, and that's work that's part of that open source project, which a bunch of other uh, libraries and tools um, have been able to, to leverage. For, for so the, the breadth of users, probably the more interesting thing is um, the work we've done to enable rich library typings. Um, so one of the things that that definitely typed project pointed out um, and a lot of feedback we got was about, was really that um, we want to be able to type all of the libraries that are out there. Um, and as we saw definitely typed grow, we started having, seeing people identify places where TypeScript type system couldn't quite express something that a library author had intended. There was some pattern of usage they had, they had intended for their API that we couldn't express uh, as, as cleanly in TypeScript as we'd like. The most significant of those uh, was the need for uh, generics. Um, so for those of you who have worked in uh, C Sharp or Java, those who have worked in C++, uh, many languages um, have a notion of, many languages with a type system have a notion of generics, which allows you to capture sort of an association between parts of a signature um, in, in the generics um, system, in the type system. Uh, and so generics has been the most highly requested feature that we've had in TypeScript since we first put it out there. Um, it's also something that impacts library typings in a significant way. It allows you to be a lot more expressive. Um, and it's something that we knew even before we put this out that we were going to have to go after um, as part of TypeScript. Uh, and TypeScript 0.9, we're introducing that for the first time. Um, there's several other features here as well um, that just improve the ability to, to um, cover libraries. But for the sake of time, I'll just show a quick look at generics um, uh, here. So... This is an example of what um, some of the types might look like for um, array. Um, so in this example, um, I have an interface array. Uh, and the interface array has a map method. That map method takes a callback. Um, and see, you can see here the sort of three things that that callback gets passed in a JavaScript implementation. Uh, and it returns an any array. 
So there's a couple of things to notice about this code. Uh, so the first is um, this here is going to infer any. And the reason it's going to infer any is because uh, a bunch of pieces of information here are looser than they really should be. Um, so the first of those is that the index here is said it takes type any. Um, that means that we don't know what elements this, this array has, so we don't know what to, pass, uh, what to pass here. So we just pass any, which is the type that is sort of the, we don't know, it could be anything. Additionally, the output type is, is called any. So we don't know what type the, the user's function callback is going to pass us, so we just say any. Um, that's a bit loose, which means that the relationship between the input and the output type is not being captured here. So the end result is, even though we have a ton of information in that call at the bottom about what the type should be, the type inference in, in TypeScript is not able to figure that out. With TypeScript 0.9, uh, we're adding the capability uh, to add type annotations. Um, so here you see interface array of T. Uh, and array of T uh, has a method called map of U. So this, this map of U, uh, you'll see now we're able to use these T's and these U's to actually capture the information about what the signature looks like. Um, so the callback should be passed uh, a value which is whatever the element type of the array is. Um, so in the case below, I have an array of strings, and that means that the function uh, that I call will get passed a string. The map function then, uh, is, its callback is going to return something, which we'll call u, uh, and the result of this function will be an array of u's. So what this means is that in this example below, we're able to track all that information. Um, so this can infer a number because we have a string array, which means that x is a string, which means x.length is a number, which means the result is a number array, which means that indexing at 0 is going to be a number. So all that information is just trafficked through uh, the TypeScript compiler. Now the really nice thing about generics is that you don't really have to worry about it for most of your code. Um, so the only code that had to add this generics code was, was uh, array. So the definition of the array type needed to add this code. But then you'll notice that in the bottom there, the code that the user writes, the code that you're writing most of the time, uh, that code didn't have to change. I just write my plain old JavaScript, but I get all this extra nice uh, JavaScript type inference. Um, so lots of, lots of nice benefits uh, to that. Looking at one other simple example here, um, knockout.js. So knockout, um, how, how many folks have, have used or seen knockout.js, just to get a sense? OK, so a fair few. Um, so, so knockout is, is one of the um, sort of uh, data binding uh, libraries, model view uh, libraries out there. Uh, and the code down at the bottom looks like some code you might kind of see in a typical, uh, in typical knockout demo. So we have a, a, a variable O, which is an object literal, has a name and an age property. Um, they're both uh, knockout observables. Uh, these knockout observables are wrapping some piece of data. So uh, the name is Bob, the, the age is 37. And then I can use those by calling um, o.name and, and, um, and o.age. So we have these wrappers over these property types. The problem is that this name function, uh, we, can't, we don't have any way of remembering what the type of the, the uh, item passed in was here. So because I just get back, because the name is just a ko.observable, I don't know what kind of data I'm going to get back when I call o.name. I don't know what kind of data I'm going to get back when I call o.age. And again, here in the, in the um, set function, I'm not going to get this checked. So with generics, we can uh, add type annotations. Um, so we can say that we don't just have one kind of observable. We have an observable which carries some data of some particular type, so an observable of t. Uh, and if I call that, I get back the t. Uh, if I call that with no parameters, I get back the t. If I call it with a single parameter of type t, uh, I will return um, any. And so this allows me to then get all the information. So now when I come down here, Oops. Um, when I come down here, my variable, uh, my name property will actually return, uh, when I say o.name, I'll get back a string. And when I say o.age, I'll get back a number. And so all this code will now be type checked. I'll get all those benefits again of, uh, of the type checking. So a couple of details of generics. So generics is fully erased. Um, so just like everything else in the types in uh, TypeScript, Generics gets fully removed and doesn't exist at runtime, so it's not, you're not paying any runtime performance penalty for any of this stuff. Um, classes and interfaces can be generic, so we saw examples of those uh, in the last couple of examples there. Uh, and also signatures can be generic, so any function I have can be generic, which means it can sort of describe multiple ways of being called. Uh, and so there's some examples of that uh, just right there. 
So one of the other things I wanted to show, um, going back to sort of some of the TypeScript um, 0.8 uh, and just core features, was what some, of the, what some of these experiences look like in larger applications. So we, I, everything I've shown, show, shown so far was sort of simple examples um, isolated to get across the idea of the language. Um, but let's take a look at what some of that looks like in, a, um, in sort of some real applications. So let me come here and I'll come back over to this page. So one of the things we have uh, on the TypeScript site is a bunch of samples um, here. And one of those is this, here we go. One of these is this little warship combat thing that one of the guys on our team uh, built. So drag these around. And then over on this side, I can sort of play, um, play a standard battleship thing. Oh, I'm not very good at this, am I? There we go. Uh, OK, so I can play this. I can, I can sink the battleship. Uh, well, sink some small ship, I guess. Um, but anyway, so simple, simple uh, sort of web-based uh, game experience there. So let me show you what that kind of looks like over in, uh, in, a, in an IDE environment. Um, so this is Visual Studio uh, 2012 uh, with the TypeScript support um, added in. Uh, and there's a couple things that are interesting to note about this example here. So the first one is we're sort of using classes and all these things uh, that we talked about in the slides, but you know, we, have, we have several of them here. Um, this is sort of a bunch of code kind of in a, in a larger application. Um, the, another thing to notice is uh, this is kind of doing a lot of the standard JavaScript, DOM manipulation, jQuery kind of things that you're probably used to seeing uh, in the JavaScript code you write. Um, so here we're using jQuery. Um, we have a, um, an element here that's an HTML element um, defined as part of the library. So one of the interesting things is um, this HTML element, if I right click and say go to definition, uh, you'll see that it takes me into a file called lib.d.ts. Uh, and this file here is part of the TypeScript distribution and is the file that describes that whole API for, uh, for the DOM. Um, so this describes things like, um, up at the top, we see the description of, of uh, the ECMAScript 5 libraries. So things like the object type, uh, the function type, um, all these pieces of the library. But it also defines things like HTML button element uh, and all kinds of other fun, <coughs> other fun things. Um, so we can come into this file and sort of see what the whole shape of this library is. And as I mentioned, this is all sort of generated from, uh, from the standards-based uh, documentation. Um, so this is all kind of uh, nice for that. So let me, let me go back into the other file here. One of the other nice things we saw, we were using jQuery here. Um, so one of the interesting things I can use with jQuery uh, is I can type dollar, hit paren, and because we are using the jQuery DTS file from definitely typed, um, I'm able to get sort of uh, rich IntelliSense based on that information. So if you're here, I can sort of pass in something, uh, hit dot, and I get back the, the completion list associated with what I'd expect on jQuery. Now, jQuery is interesting because jQuery has this plug-in model, right, where, where a bunch of the stuff comes, uh, a bunch of the capabilities of jQuery come as part of jQuery itself, but then many different uh, plugins sort of build on top of jQuery in various ways. And one of the challenges with TypeScript in a sort of statically typed model was how to model that kind of composition where different libraries all contribute into the same, uh, into the same thing. So here, for instance, we have add class. If I click, uh, go to definition on that, you'll see this takes me into a file jQuery.d.ts, which describes the core jQuery API. Um, so you'll see the standard uh, two overloads um, of the add class capability. One of the interesting things, though, is that if I come here and type draggable, uh, draggable is actually not part of jQuery, it's part of jQuery UI. Um, so if I complete on this and say go to definition, you see it takes me into a different file. Um, this takes me into jQuery UI.d.ts. But what it actually did is both of these, um, both these files declared this interface jQuery. So they both said, I am defining a component of, a, of an interface called jQuery. And so because jQuery UI actually goes and modifies the prototype of the jQuery um, uh, function, uh, it's going to go and add these things onto that prototype. So it, it can extend that interface and say, this jQuery interface additionally has these things, any environment where I include this as well. And so that means that now I can get that IntelliSense based on any of those components um, as well. So just one last thing to show. Um, uh, we can use TypeScript uh, uh, on any platform. So we've shown it in some of these tools here. Um, TypeScript is available as a... Um, as an NPM package. Uh, oops. So um, on any platform that you're working on, you can, uh, you can install the, the TypeScript package. Um, this takes a few seconds because I have uh, a local copy of it here. Um, 
But TypeG is available um, on Node. It runs in any, any host environment, so we can run it on Node, but you can also run it in any kind of other environment you might be in. Um, and it installs on your system. When you run it, install under Node, it, it installs this TSC. And so I can go and run TSC. Uh, and TSC uh, is just the TypeScript compiler, which allows me to compile um, any other code I might have. So if I come in and say something like TypeScript uh, samples um, image board, this is an example of a Node application, for instance, uh, written using TypeScript. Um, so we can say something like uh, TSC app.ts to compile that. So when I run that now, if I look at the JS here, um, that generated a bunch of different uh, generated app.js, db.js, and a whole the parts of my application. Um, so you can use TypeScript for many of these things. You can use it for web-based uh, jQuery style programming. You can use it for um, node programming. You can use it for any uh, kind of JavaScript development you're doing um, in a very natural way. All right, so uh, just in summary, uh, you can try TypeScript now. Um, 0.8 is available right now. 0.9 is coming out soon with some of those generics features I showed. Um, everything I talked about today is available at typescriptlang.org. So thank you very much. I'll be around for questions after this. Thanks. Thanks.